the price. While the Enterprise hosts negotiations for control of a stable wormhole, Troy forms a personal relationship with an opposing negotiator. At the beginning of the episode, we get a glimpse of Troy in her downtime. I thought it was a good little insight into what these characters do when they're not facing down whatever imminent threat is in front of them. I did like that scene in general, especially when she got frustrated at being interrupted. Agreed. Picard to Counselor Troy. Now what? Picard asks Troy to celebrate their arrival at the wormhole. God forbid I should miss my first look at the wormhole. Premier Bhavani, representing the Barzans, is basically auctioning off a stable wormhole to the Federation, the Caldonians, and Devanani Ral, representing the Chrysalians. And his introduction was pretty goofy. And I'm Devanani Ral. Because that's how I introduce myself <laughs> when I walk into a room. <laughs> His entire attitude was way too much. He's played by Matt McCoy, who I immediately recognized as Lloyd Braun from Seinfeld. Another sale, Mr. Costanza. Chalk me up on the big board. I knew him from the movie Abominable, where he doesn't play a huge dick. It's one of three Bigfoot movies that he's in. Really? I saw that there was at least one more, but I, I didn't keep looking. And that's why you haven't found Bigfoot yet. <laughs> <laughs> that explains everything. <laughs> The wormhole would provide a shortcut across a huge chunk of the galaxy, so everyone wants it. During beginning negotiations, the Ferengi also show up, and I really like Picard's reactions to that. Willing chairs. I'm Captain Picard of the Enterprise. I am serving as host for these proceedings. Good. Then see to it we get some chairs. Let me explain. Fine, fine. Just have your Klingon server and get us some chairs. Troy is doing some Facebook creeping on Rawl and then lies about it. And everybody knows dishonesty is the best way to start a relationship. I was just looking over some personnel files. Rawl comes into her room and creeps on her hard and then somehow manages to set up a date and then immediately leaves. The way the music was happening and the things he was saying and the way he was acting, I was under the impression that he was exerting some sort of mind control or emotional manipulation or something, but it turns out he's not. As soon as Troy sees him, she has a strong reaction. And at the time, you kind of give it a pass because it'll probably be explained later, but it never is. And in a surprising move by the crew, they want more information on how the wormhole works and go through logical steps to get it, as opposed to just throwing themselves into it immediately. Hmm. Nobody's going in there until we have done a full sensor analysis. Meanwhile, this is still going on. We have not established that Rahl is not manipulating Troy in some way, and I'm still not sure at this point. We see that Riker is very suspicious of Rahl, but on his part, there's no real reason for it because he doesn't see the stuff that's going on between Rahl and Troy. And he also suspects that the wormhole is not as stable as it appears, also for no particular reason. At one point, Troy orders champagne, and Rahl tacks on. Champagne. For two. I would use that all the time to alter people's meals and stuff. You know, someone would be like, I want a hot cup of, and be like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> the Ferengi have poisoned the Federation representative to get him out of the negotiations, so Riker fills in instead. When we first get the introduction of the idea of them poisoning somebody, you kind of wonder who it's gonna be, and it turns out to be somebody not important, and it turns out not to affect anything really that's going on anyway. Meanwhile, this is still going on, it turns out that Rahl is also part Betazoid and uses that to his advantage in negotiations. I like when Riker and Rahl are arguing in just a super passive aggressive way. Nobody comes right out and insults the other, but they're kind of aiming barbs around each other and pretending that they're not offended by what the other one is saying. If you don't understand something, I hope you won't be too embarrassed to ask me. Jordi and Data and some of the Ferengi take shuttles into the wormhole, and when they come out of the other side, they find out that they're not in the place that they expected to be. Jordi picks up subatomic fluctuations with his visor. Why would it be able to pick that up? What's the practical use of that? And how can he even know what he's looking at? Jordi and his ever-expanding visor capabilities. Then we get the most out-of-place scene in this whole episode, where Beverly and Troy wear these ridiculous workout clothes and act like they are setting up a porn scene. <laughs> I 
feel completely out of control. Happy, terrified. But there's nothing rational about this. Who needs rational when your toes curl up? Jumping back to the main plot, the Caledonians just kind of drop out of negotiations based on Raoul's side negotiations, which I thought was kind of disappointing. I kind of wanted to see more than just the Federation against Raoul. The Caledonian is played by Kevin Peter Hall, who was the Predator in Predator and Predator 2. That's awesome. I did not know that. He should have reprised his character in this show. Yeah, Picard just keeps getting the three triangle dots on his <laughs> forehead. <laughs> On the other side of the wormhole, Jordy is arguing with the Ferengi that the wormhole put them in the wrong spot. It's a dumb argument. Just look at the freaking map. Jordy tells the Ferengi that the wormhole is going to close and then reopen somewhere else. And he actually calls the Ferengi idiots. I'm surprised to hear him actually say that. Idiots. So Jordy and Data go back through and the Ferengi are left behind. And those two actually do show up later in a Voyager episode, which takes place in the Delta Quadrant. We cut to Raul and Troy eating salads with space forks. This is the only conversation the two of them have that has any real impact to the episode. Troy is arguing that Raul using his empathic abilities in negotiations is unethical, but she only approaches it from her perspective. I liked his argument that she does the same thing even though I disagree. I mean, he's a negotiator. He wants to win, and I think he makes pretty valid points. True. I felt that because Troy is a main character and she has a problem with it, it's supposed to make everything Rahl is doing wrong. I agree with Troy. She doesn't use her ability in business negotiations. She uses it in matters of life and death, or legal matters, you could say. She's enforcing the law, where Rahl is doing it entirely for personal advantage. And you have a problem with him doing that? I wouldn't go that far. It doesn't make sense in the episode, because the way they talk about it, it's as if he's somehow using his ability to control people, but that's not what it does. But you're reading their emotional states, their inner selves, and then using that to manipulate them. Well, people have been doing that for thousands of years, just by listening carefully, by, by watching body language. It's just inconsistent. It doesn't fit the way his abilities actually work and the way they're presented as affecting things. And to me, it made it seem like Troy was saying any alien with any ability should never use it if it gives them an advantage over anybody else. That's a good point. Even given Rawls' advantages, his success as a negotiator would only come through his ability to make compelling arguments anyway. Rawl also tries to play Riker and get some good digs in. Your point of view, not mine. Oh, I see that, Commander. I see that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be second in command of this starship. Yeah, I could not stop laughing through that entire scene. It was great. Rawl is way more arrogant than Riker, but it's still good to see Riker get shut down. And then when Riker turns things around, it's even more satisfying to see the same thing happen to Rawl. The Ferengi say that the negotiations were rigged by the Federation, so they launch a missile at the wormhole, which Picard tells them will not do anything, but they shoot it down in case it damages the shuttle when it comes back out. At one point, when the Ferengi's talking to Picard, for some reason, he's dubbed. Explode near the shuttlecraft, they will be destroyed. Casualties of war, Captain. My men are prepared to die. You know, I noticed at other parts of the episode, some of the Ferengi were dubbed. I wouldn't be surprised if it was because it was hard to understand what they were saying with their fake teeth and they had them recorded again. Troy says the Ferengi is lying. For once, they stop and listen to her. Then Rawl and the Premier enter the bridge. Rawl reveals he made a deal with the Barzans. It turns out the Ferengi firing the missile was a ruse set up between the Ferengi and Rawl. I thought it was funny that Troy uses her empathic abilities to let Picard know the Ferengi was bluffing, which is pretty much the exact point that Rawl made in their conversation before. I like how Troy calls Rawl out right in front of everyone. She says there's no tension between him and the Ferengi, so clearly they're working together. And I also like the way the Ferengi protests. What? I, I was tense. I was ready to blow it up. What? I strongly protest. Screen off. off. Data and Jordy then emerge from the wormhole and let everyone know that the wormhole doesn't even work the way that they thought, so this whole episode has been pointless. The end. Rawl visits Troy again, and his manipulative attitude has not changed at all. He asks Troy to go with him, and when she says no, he shows how much of a sociopath he is by leaving without saying another word. The price. Overall? Lots of good ideas, and a good overall scenario, but the episode is poorly written. Given the story and the ideas, it's ironic that we don't get into any of the characters' heads. 
Characters say and do weird things without real explanation, and we never get deep enough into any of the plots or subplots to really care about what's happening. The Ferengi poison threat is set up, but it doesn't go anywhere. There were several little moments that I liked, like seeing Troy in her personal life at the beginning, but as a whole, the episode was pretty frustrating. I would give it a C. I gave it a C-. minus. I did like how we get some more real-life views of how characters act outside of their up-to-now fixed personas. The concept itself was interesting. Watching the negotiations unfold between Raal and Riker was pretty good. I'm a little disappointed that the Keldonians didn't really do anything or show their viewpoint. And the Ferengi seemed unnecessary to this episode. The comic relief factor didn't really contribute anything, and their plot to get the Federation negotiator out of the way didn't really matter since he hadn't actually done anything before Riker stepped in. Troy's whole subplot seemed really out of place. I didn't really understand why it was included, and the awkward way it tried to sink into the negotiation plot didn't really work. The price turned out to be 45 minutes I'm never going to get back. 